I'd like to introduce Dr. Karina Fiorati to you. Um, she is an expert in cell-based assays. She received her postdoc uh, from Harvard University, and she has been in the cell-based industry. Uh, gosh, she spent about 15 years uh, at Pfizer developing cell-based assays, and she actually came to the dark side of business development at BioAgilitics a couple of years ago. Um, but she's used her talent for various reasons, helping out in operations as well as educating our clients um, in these types of presentations. So I'd like to introduce you, Dr. Hirai. So today I would like to focus on um, antibody drug conjugate development and focus more on neutralizing antibody cell-based assays. So ADCs are promising alternatives to naked antibodies for selected drug delivery and treatment of, of cancer. And they are made up of three components, a monoclonal antibody, a cytotoxic small molecule drug, and a linker that, that um, links the two, two together. So ADCs were developed with the idea to, to sort of, if you could think of it as a warhead on, on a guided missile. The antibody guides the ADC to the tumor cells where it's internalized and the cytotoxic small molecule is released to perform its cell killing uh, functions. Now the complexity of the ADC does arise from its heterogeneous nature in terms of its antibody to drug ratio, so what we call a DAR, which is also further complicated in vivo. So this is where a lot of the complexity in the bioanalytical uh, world comes from. Now, as we all know, all, all biotherapeutics, including ADCs, do have the potential to elicit an immune response through the production of both non-neutralizing and neutralizing antibodies. And this can affect PK, PD, efficacy, safety of, of your molecule. Non-neutralizing antibodies bind their target outside of the target, oops, range. But neutralizing antibodies are of major concern because they actually bind in the target site, therefore inhibiting the ability of the drug to bind to, to the cell and therefore uh, resulting in an inability of, of the drug to perform its, its activities. Now, in order to assess the immunogenic potential of these molecules, an appropriate analytical strategy, of course, is needed to correlate um, also the laboratory results that you get with clinical findings. So the identification and characterization of an ADA is obviously a critical component of the drug development process and should be based on a risk-based approach in terms of how much immunogenicity assessment will be needed for a particular molecule. So immunogenicity monitoring strategies are based, like I said, on a thorough risk assessment and this consists of two parts. The probability of the biotherapeutic to elicit an immunogenic response, and if induced, the severity of the potential consequences. So this should be a living document that is refined um, by acquisition and interpretation of your preclinical and clinical data. And immunogenicity strategies that are followed for other biotherapeutics are appropriate for ADCs, but with additional characterization to better understand the ADA specificity. So assessing the risk for clinically um, important immunogenicity is, is complex, and it does depend on both intrinsic factors related to the protein and how it's manufactured, and, to, um, and extrinsic factors related to the treatment regime, the patient population, and the target, the target population. A product, I'm not gonna go through all of these um, risk um, issues, but just suffice it to say that a few of them, are a product-related factor is the hydrophobicity of the small molecule cytotoxic drug, which could cause the ADC to aggregate. And as multiple cytotoxin uh, moieties are, are present on the ADC, anti-cytotoxin ADAs may have the potential to form large immune complexes and cause toxicity. A, patient, a potential patient-related factor for immunogenicity is obviously prior exposure to a different ADC, but with the same cytotoxin and linker, but a different monoclonal antibody. Actually, one hallmark consequence of a high-risk immune response is obviously uh, neutralization of an endogenous essential uh, counterpart. So ADAs, once um, internalized, are acidified and catabolized within the lysosome, 
and are expected to lose their neutralizing function. Also, furthermore, the, the generally well-tolerated human immunoglobulin component, the IV route of administration, and the immunosuppressed oncology population all point to a lower risk, um, immunogenicity risk. However, because there's such limited clinical data available, AD, ADCs are typically um, classified as medium risk with regards to immunogenicity. So as most of you know, ADCs are biologically challenging drugs, and this is due to their heterogeneous nature and complex in vivo behavior. So immune responses directed against the ADCs can include ADAs against all components of the ADC, including the cytotoxic drug, the monoclonal antibody, any neoepitopes that are formed as a result of the conjugation. So when you're assessing immunogenicity, specialized reagents are needed to assess the immunogenicity for ADC. So typically two positive controls with specificity to either the unconjugated antibody or the cytotoxic portions of the ADC are needed. So samples may contain also um, high concentrations of drug and which could interfere with standard immunogenicity assessment. So sometimes you could use acid dissociation, however, a very thorough understanding of the linker chemistry is needed because a lot of the linkers are pH labile. So in terms of the actual immunogenicity assessment, the available regulatory and industry guidelines on conducting immuno immunogenicity assessments can be applied to ADCs and typically do follow the standard tiered approach of screening, confirmation, characterization, including domain specificity once those reagents are available because they're typically not at the beginning of a program. And then when you get into the clinical phase, then you can assess neutralizing antibody potential. And it's, again, al always important to correlate laboratory results with, with clinical findings. So a common characteristic of confirmed ADA positive samples is testing for NAB activity. And two formats can be used, either a competitive, um, non-cell-based competitive ligand binding assay, or a cell-based uh, bioassay. And selection of the appropriate assay format depends on various factors. First and foremost, the mechanism of action of the drug and its ability to reflect the in vivo situation most closely. Again, you also have to look at selectivity, specificity, precision, robustness. So a lot goes into the development of a cell-based assay. The FDA does recommend the use of a cell-based bioassay, as typically they do most closely re reflect the in vivo situation and do provide more relevant information than a competitive ligand binding assay. So the basis for detecting a NAB lies in its ability to observe a shift in the drug-specific cellular response. So the sample is pre-incubated with a therapeutic if NABs are present, the drug is unable to bind to its target, resulting in an inhibition of the assay response. So the endpoint for these cellular responses must be specific and must provide the necessary sensitivity to be able to measure um, the response that you're looking for. The cellular responses for these assays are numerous and can be categorized as either early, such as receptor phosphorylation or receptor binding, or late, such as cellular proliferation, cytotoxicity, apoptosis, cytokine production, and reporter gene expression events. So for ADCs, the NAB assessment for the whole drug molecule should be evaluated first based on the inhibition of re relevant drug activity. So the ADC domains, both the monoclonal antibody and the cytotoxin, are involved in sequential steps of the drug functional pathway leading to cell death. So therefore, since both domains, the monoclonal antibody and the cytotoxic drug, are involved in sequential steps of the drug development um, of the drug uh, pathway, a single cell-based NAB assay, typically using a late step, such as apoptosis or proliferation, um, can be used because it is reflective of the mechanism of action of the drug. So the inhibitory effect of the NAB would then indicate binding to one or more of the domains. So generally, the use of a single NAB assay is preferred unless a more detailed evaluation of domain-specific NAB is justified. But typically, you're going to glean that information from the ADA screening results. So if you don't see it in the ADA screening, you're not going to really need to go further in the NAB assessment. 
So, of course, critical reagents are very, very important. Um, my old boss at Pfizer used to say they're like, they're like um, grapes. You know, when you're making a fine wine, you want to have nice grapes, and the grapes make good wines. So reagents make good assays. So for immunogenicity assays for ADCs, we require specialized uh, reagents uh, as controls. And you also need to make sure that there's adequate quality and quantity of these critical reagents um, in immunogenicity assessments, and it's imperative uh, for, est for establishing a robust and reproducible assay. It's also important to understand the long-term availability. So if you're going to look at new lots of reagents, it's important to have a strategy for bridging those lots to make sure that the results that you're getting are, are still consistent with, with what you had, let's say, a year or two years ago. So surrogate positive control antibodies that exhibit neutralizing activity against the monoclonal antibody and the payload are required. And this can be sometimes difficult to generate um, and does require a sufficient lead time to make sure that, that you are able to actually get neutralizing antibodies specifically to the payload, which sometimes can be difficult. And the PC is typically um, obtained from non-clinical immunizations, which doesn't really reflect the heterogeneous ADA response that's found in patient sera. The other problem is with labeling. So if you're going to be labeling the ADC to use either in, in a competitive ligand binding assay or a cell-based assay or an AD, ADA assay, these molecules have already undergone several rounds of conjugation. So if you're further labeling, it's important to understand how that labeling will affect the immunogenicity assays. So, for example, sites for conjugation within the CDR may be modified, thus compromising the ability of the critical reagents to detect the NAP. So it's important to confirm the integrity of the binding activities using proper analytical controls. So just a quick sort of life cycle of what a cell-based assay would look like. There's obviously a lot of key steps that are involved in developing a cell-based assay. First, you're going through your re research phase, understand your molecule, understand the linker, understand you know, what um, assay output you want to use, make sure that you have your critical reagents, make sure that you have your test species matrix, both your PC and your negative control, which sometimes, again, can be difficult to, to acquire. First and foremost, in a cell-based assay, one of the, the key steps is selecting a suitable cell line, obviously, that responds to the drug in a measurable manner in the presence of sample matrix, and it must provide the proper sensitivity and dynamic range to be able to measure that response. Then you have to choose the proper cellular response, make sure that the endpoint is specific, select your positive controls, and then optimize the assay uh, with many, many parameters. And I'll go through a little bit of, of uh, sort of how you would go about assessing all the different parameters, such as drug concentration, um, density, cell passage number, and how those affect the assay signal. The negative control, like I mentioned, is a pool of drug-naive human biological matrix, preferably representative of the baseline reactivity in the clinical trial population that's being tested. So once you've sort of established what you want to look at, your endpoints, you have your cell line, key method characteristics for NAB assays that allow you to gauge their performance in include looking at sensitivity, because you want to make sure that you have a, enough dyma dynamic range to be able to measure a NAB response. The specificity is very important because a lot of um, s effects in the matrix, that your cells can respond to different um, molecules in your matrix, so therefore giving you false results. So it's really important to just add controls to make sure that you're not getting any um, confounding uh, results from your specificity assessments. Then once you've done all that, you can go through qualification and or validation. Um, I do have transfer here at the end, but some sponsors, like I mentioned before, will transfer the assay during development. Some will transfer the assay during qualification and or validation to a CRO or to another group internally. So during qualification um, and validation, there are multiple parameters that you would like to assess. Again, making sure that you have the appropriate sensitivity and making sure that it is fit for its intended uh, purpose. 
and then you can go ahead and transfer either internally or to, to a CRO for further sample analysis. Now, due to the complexity of cell-based um, assay development, a statistical multi-factor design of experiments, or DOE, can be implemented and is really well suited to evaluate and optimize the parameters of many factors on the response of the assay. So multiple experimental factors can be varied simultaneously as opposed to the standard practice of varying only one factor at a time. So that both individual and interactive effects can be elucidated in fewer experiments and at a fraction of the time typically required for one factor at a time experiments. I'm a huge advocate of DOE and I think it's a very effective and efficient way of optimizing assays, particularly for cell-based assays. So your controllable factors are parameters that affect your system, and they can be either numerical or categorical. But the responses must have measured outputs that are at least semi-quantitative for statistical analysis. And I don't know how many of you actually do use DOE in your, in your development endeavors. Maybe a show of hands. Oh, good. OK, good. So the ADC bioassays can be validated following our existing guidelines for therapeutics. Um, the fundamental parameters for validation, of course, include cut point, which is very important to determine positive or negative, and typically about a 1% false uh, positive rate, a statistically uh, set false positive rate is acceptable for a cut point. This also what is very important is to make sure that the assay is sensitive, specific, and that the selectivity and precision reproducibility, robustness of the assay, and some features of stability um, can also be assessed. So determination, like I said, of the cut point is a fundamental um, aspect of, of assay development and, and making sure that you've set that cut point um, appropriately. So as NAB assays are most commonly performed only on samples that are confirmed to have antigen-specific ADA, Confirmatory approaches are not usually necessary. I do know that some sponsors do embark on confirmatory NAB assays, but in my experience, we typically do not run them. So there's a lot of ADCs that are in clinical development right now, and hopefully with increasing, with these increasing numbers in clinical trials and post-market surveillance, more clinical data is going to be collected that will increase our understanding of ADCs and help identify the main species that are influencing immunogenic behavior. And these can also inform appropriate immunogenicity strategies moving forward. So these learnings will hopefully also guide both industry and regulatory agencies to more defined guidelines and our white papers regarding immunogenicity assessment for these armed antibodies. And just um, going you know, quickly through the, through the conclusions, you know, I've hopefully impressed upon you that the development of a cell-based assay is quite complex and specifically with um, ADCs, there's just other, other aspects that need to be considered from a typical monoclonal antibody. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I will welcome any questions now or, or later.